Hi. In this series of videos, I want to talk about constructing elaborate pipelines in scikit-learn. Pipelines in scikit-learn are incredibly powerful because they come with some safety guarantees, but they are also very expressive, and that is something I want to highlight in this video. To help me with that, uh, I have the Titanic dataset open. Uh, that's a dataset that you can fetch uh, using the fetch openml uh, function in scikit-learn. And this dataset contains information about passengers of the Titanic. And the thing that one usually tries to predict is whether or not a passenger survived the Titanic shipwreck. What's interesting about this dataset is that we have a bunch of information at our disposal, but also in a bunch of formats. So for example, we know how much a person paid for the ticket. Uh, we also know their name. Uh, we also know their uh, gender. We know their age and also what passenger class they were. This video won't be about making the perfect model. Instead, it's more going to be about how can we get a pipeline just the way we want it to, to encode all of these columns in a way that a machine learning can actually access them. And just to sort of highlight some flexibility here, I have a passenger class. Um, there are three classes. You can be first class, second class, or third class. But that's information that I probably don't want to encode as a number. Instead, I probably want to encode that as separate distinct classes. So you're either first class or second class or third class. So this needs to be one hot encoded, so to say. I would like that to turn into a matrix of ones and zeros where most places there is going to be a zero, but if you are second class, then there should be a one index on the second column, so to say. That feels like a pretty okay encoding for the passenger class. And I would like to do something similar here. This data set only has male and female. So that would also be something I would like to one-hot encode. And then we've got age. And age is an interesting one. Because for the age, I could say, well, the age itself is fine. That's a nice uh, numeric column that I could throw into an algorithm. But maybe I want to pass some information along as well. I remember watching a Titanic movie, and at some point in the movie they say, women and children first. And I don't know how historically accurate that is, but I can imagine that being a child could increase the odds of you getting onto the lifeboat. So in order to encode that, I probably want to have a column here where, again, it's going to be ones or zeros. But let's say I want to make sure that you're uh, less than 18 years old for that feature. And maybe I want to have another one where you have to be less than 12, just to have an indication that you're indeed really, really young. And let's maybe say... The fair, that's also something I would like to encode, let's say. That's also a fine numeric column, but um, I hope that already, just by showing you these few columns, there is already a little bit of flexibility that we will need. And, and I do think it's going to be a useful exercise to show how you can get your features set up this way. So I hope this paints a picture of what we're going to do in this video. So to get that ball rolling, um, I'll just start simple, and we're going to make it more elaborate as we go along. Okay, so let's start by importing a few things. I'm first going to import the pipeline class. We'll need that to construct a pipeline. And I'll be focusing on this column first. And I said that I wanted to one-hot encode this. So I will need uh, that preprocessor. From preprocessing, import the one-hot encoder. But I also want to be specific, which means that I want to select this column and only one-hot encode that. And there are definitely a couple of ways to do this, and I'm just going to start with one way, which is to use the scrub library, which comes with a very likable select calls component, which, as the name implies, just selects a column. And here's kind of what's nice about that. It allows me to construct what I think is a pretty readable pipeline object. To help me explain what it does, though, um, I'm going to evaluate it, and that's going to give me this uh, nice little render in the notebook. So what does this pipeline do? Well, let's consider what goes in. That's a data frame with that Titanic passenger information. Then this first component is just going to make a selection. It's just going to select a single column. So out of this comes the passenger class column, nothing else. And then that one column is the thing that's going to be one halt encoded. And to just confirm that that works, what I can do is I can uh, tell the pipeline to uh, fit on this uh, data going in. And I can tell it to immediately transform the data afterwards as well. Uh, and to just make it a little bit easier to read, uh, I will uh, tell the one-hot encoder uh, not to output sparse information. So this is perhaps less memory efficient, but it is nice and viewable 
uh, we can definitely see that all these different columns are either a zero or a one, and they're mutually exclusive. So uh, it's either going to be first, second, or third class. And indeed, we can see that uh, stuff kind of gets encoded nicely. Now, one thing that you might have noticed as I was uh, using this class over here to declare the pipeline is that this pipeline object actually accepts a list of tuples. And that allows us to give a name to a component. And that's actually also just kind of good to show, right? So there, there are some parameters that are attached to the pipeline. And this name over here refers to passenger class column, which is the column selector. And we can indeed see that uh, it has a value. So that's the name that I gave it, then double underscore, and then calls. Um, and that calls refers to the input that you're giving that object. So this is kind of like a uh, special syntax that's very scikit-learn specific, but it does effectively allow you to give a name to an input parameter of some component of this pipeline. Similarly, this uh, sparse output that I've set over here, that's part of this pclass encoder name, and then two underscores here, sparse output. Uh, we can see that the false that we assigned here uh, also finds its way there. And just for uh, illustrative purposes, I can uh, remove that, uh, and then the default parameter true would appear here. Now this get params is going to be especially useful if you are interested in doing grid search later on, because that allows you to uh, construct a grid with settings that refer to these names. But for now, it's just important to know that if you want tight control in a sense that you want to have specific names to components, then using this way of constructing a pipeline is going to be just kind of nice and useful. So this way of construction works, it's fine, but there is also a more shorthand way of doing this. Um, there is also a make pipeline function that we can use. And this make pipeline function effectively allows you to construct this in a very similar way. It's just that you don't pass tuples or a list. You just pass all the components in sequence uh, like so. When I run this, the output is exactly the same. When we have a look at the pipeline as constructed, it is also exactly the same. However, the one subtle difference is that the names of the parameters, because we're not giving the name explicitly, scikit-learn will have to come up with a name on your behalf. And it just uses a convention. So this is the uh, select calls class. Um, we're just gonna lowercase all of that, and that's going to be the name of that component in the pipeline, so to say. Uh, scikit-learn comes with a couple of um, neat safety features. So if I were to, so if I were to have a pipeline with two components that technically have the same name, uh, scikit-learn will just uh, add a suffix with a number uh, to make sure that there is a distinction between these two components. So personally, I do find myself using this make pipeline function a whole lot. It's just that sometimes when I want to be really specific with names, I will also use the uh, pipeline uh, constructor directly. But this make pipeline function uh, sure is nice and useful. That said, uh, let's now uh, make this pipeline a bit more elaborate. Um, we are currently only doing something with a passenger class. Uh, maybe it's time we do something with age as well. And that's where we might need to do s something of a tree split because we have that data frame and we have sort of a, a branch over here that's going to deal with the passenger class. But now we also need to have a separate branch that does the same thing, but for uh, the age. And this pipeline over here gives us a nice way to uh, click components together uh, in sequence. But now we need to do something that allows us to click these components together next to each other. Uh, and for that, uh, there is something that's called a feature union uh, that works in a very similar way as this pipeline. And it also comes with a very similar uh, make union function. So uh, let me write that up. I'm gonna make a union. One branch of that union is going to be this pipeline. That's the thing I have over here. Uh, but then right next to it, I am going to uh, select the age as well. And there we go. We uh, get a nice little update over here. Uh, we seem to have one branch that's going to uh, deal with the passenger class. And we have this other branch over here that's going to deal with uh, the age. Uh, we can confirm that by uh, expanding the component in its interface. Uh, definitely age, definitely passenger class. And also just for good measure, if I were to call a fit transform on this, uh, that we can see that we still have our one hot encoded representation over here. 
Uh, but now we also see the age column appear uh, right next to it. So that's exactly uh, what I want. Now, there is actually a fancy thing we can do at this point that's also just kind of good to show. Um, so what I could do now is I could actually add a model to this pipeline. Uh, I'm not done with uh, the features just yet, but there is an opportunity to show off a cool little trick here. So let's use this histogram gradient boosting classifier for that. I'm just going to introduce a naming convention. So uh, I have my feature pipeline over here. And then my main pipeline is going to take that feature pipeline and it's then going to follow that up with a classifier. So let's see what that looks like. Well, we can see that there's now a model at the end, right? But something that's just kind of neat and useful is that we can also see that this entire pipeline over here, the stuff that handles all the features, that itself is a pipeline component, which I can use as input for another pipeline. Just like I can add a pipeline inside of a feature union, uh, I can also add a pipeline to a pipeline that has a model at the end. And there is an opportunity here to structure your code to make it just a little bit more readable uh, by splitting the pipeline up sometimes. And this is a, a trick that not everyone uh, makes use of. You don't necessarily have to put everything into one big pipeline. There's definitely a moment to uh, split it up nicely. So let's make it even more elaborate uh, again. Uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to uh, do something here. Because this age column over here, uh, I would like to binarize that a little bit. I want to say something like, well, if you're under 18, then I want to have ones and zeros. And if you're under 12, then I want to do the same thing as well. So uh, I'm going to uh, make some changes here. All right, so instead of just making a age selection, I now built this uh, pipeline around it. So let's just go over the details here. The thing with that age column is that there are a couple of um, not available number values in there. And while that is something that some algorithms can deal with, uh, just for illustrative purposes and for safety, I figured I might go ahead and um, impute that. So whenever I see this number appear, I am going to replace that. And in this case, I'm going to replace that with the value 19. Now, this value is chosen somewhat arbitrarily. Again, the point here is not to make the perfect model. But the reason that I went for 19 has to do with the steps that follow. Because of that whole women and children first argument, um, I want to indicate whether or not we are probably dealing with a child. And if I don't know what your age was, then it does feel safer to assume that maybe you weren't a child. This is totally an assumption. In real life, you would totally have to grid search that. But in order to make sure that none of these components fail if there is a not available number value, um, I have done this imputation here. Notice the way that this works. So age goes in, then it gets imputed. And then because there is a make union here, we also get the split. And then we check whether or not it's less than 18 or less than 12. And then these two features that come out are going to be concatenated. That is something that we can confirm by looking at the pipeline below as well. So uh, age column gets selected. We're going to impute. Uh, and then we're going to say, are you less than uh, 18 or 12? And that's a, a thresholdy thing. So it's definitely getting more elaborate. But I will add one final extra thing here, and that is to this top, uh, and that is to this top union over here. Uh, I do want to select some extra columns because in this pipeline over here, I do lose the original actual age, and I do want to add that. And maybe there's some extra information uh, like the fare, uh, like the price someone paid for a, a ticket. That might also be something I want to add. So that's looking pretty good. We now have our uh, numeric features at the end over here. Uh, there's one final thing that comes to mind actually as I do this. And that is that I also want to know whether or not you were male or female. So let's add that as well. Um, that's going to be very similar to what I'm doing over here, except that this one hot encoder is going to uh, now apply to this one column over here. So, all right, this is a pretty elaborate pipeline. Now, as a next step, uh, what I could do is I could maybe clean this up a little bit. Uh, what I could do is I could say, well, uh, let's make this into a separate component in its own variable. Same thing here, just to make it a little bit more separated, so to say. 
But what we can also do at this point is just take a step back and appreciate what we have here. Because let's now say we're interested in actually using this model. Let's say that we're actually trying to uh, do some training. We are going to deal with a set of data where we're going to train on as well as a set of data that we're going to test on. And some of the components that you see here are going to have to learn from the train set in order to make a prediction on the test set. In particular, these one-hot encoders are uh, going to be relevant for that because it has to learn all the different values that it needs to one-hot encode. And it's going to get that from the train set before it's going to be applied to the test set. Not to mention that we're also going to be having a model here uh, that needs to be completely different depending on the columns that we have or have not seen. And even though theoretically it is possible to not use the pipeline, but to do all of this by hand, the fact that we have that in a single object and the fact that the entire scikit-learn ecosystem knows how to play nice with this pipeline, that is going to be a huge feature. And what I also hope to have shown here is that we are incredibly flexible um, in how we can construct these pipelines. We can really tune it just right uh, for the way that we think we should model things. Two things about that though. Um, what I will say is that this is not necessarily going to be the way you should featureize your model for the best performance for this data set. The exercise here was really to uh, make an elaborate pipeline. Second, there is also a slightly different syntax that we can go ahead and use to construct this particular pipeline. The way that I'm going about this right now is pretty manual. And even though this does work, and even though it is all still pretty straightforward, there's also an opportunity to clean up this code just a little bit by using some more modern components from scikit-learn. And that's something I want to explore in the next video.